We all have our favorite seasons of Survivor. We also have our personal darling seasons, those guilty pleasures that we don't want to tell anyone about. However, pretty much anyone you ask will list Heroes vs. Villains, Kagayan, Token Chains, and David vs. Goliath as top tier seasons, no questions asked. However, there are some seasons that are unfairly judged or leave a bad impression in your mouth after a first time watch due to their bad gameplay from a lot of players, characters who outlast our favorites, or the classic and unsatisfying winner. Today, I am going to rank and discuss which 10 seasons of Survivor are underrated and hopefully inspire you to consider giving them a second chance, a rewatch, if you will. And be sure to stick around until the end of this video as I will also be revealing the results of the time I asked you all what your underrated seasons are as well. Keep in mind that as of the time of the recording of this video, there are only 40 seasons that have completed airing on television, so seasons 41 and onwards are not not considered here. Thank you for liking this video, commenting, and subscribing to the channel. This video was made possible by the patrons on my Patreon, and every month they vote on what videos I should make, like this one. Consider joining them to get videos early and to pick what videos I make. Now on to the top 10 most underrated Survivor seasons. 39 days, 18 people, one Survivor. Number 10, Season 17, Survivor Gabon. Now here is a season that is overlooked by the general fandom because of a lackluster winner, bad gameplay, and the general pettiness of the entire cast. People are just salty at each other by the end, and for the most part, this is not what we watch Survivor for. Baseline expectation going into a season is that we want it to be lighthearted, have a bunch of humor, a bit of sweetness, combined with good gameplay. I think most fans can agree that's what you expect going into a season, hence why Kai Gaian, David vs. Goliath, Token Chains, and Heroes vs. Villains are constantly considered locks as favorite seasons, but Gabon is almost the opposite to a casual fan. The first time I watched Gabon, it was with someone who had never seen Survivor, a show I'd hyped up probably too much at that point. I'm pretty sure by the time the merge hit, I was apologizing and explaining how this isn't normal, I swear Survivor's usually better than this. And as I was doing some research for this video, I found that I am not alone in this thought. Articles from back when the season aired on television show just how unimpressed everyone else was as well, and even to this day, no one on the Survivor Facebook groups, which is where I go to get the casual fan opinions, ever mention Gabon as a season that they like, but there have been some people on Reddit and even on my YouTube channel that champion this season and I agree with them. Gabon is a beautiful mess. No one who makes it to the merge seems to be playing a good game. Everyone has their faults and it is amazing. The sheer pettiness over stupid things like cookies is just the tip of the iceberg here. Crystal shouting when voting for Randy? Hmm perfection. The insane amount of fights over the massive slingshot that is like six inches from the goal. This isn't the government guys. Just take action. You can't miss. Gabon just in general does not have good gameplay, but what it does have is a cast of characters playing the game in a way that is like watching ill behaved children just interact. They constantly bicker, fight, make dumb social moves, and yet it is a slow moving train wreck that you cannot peel your eyes off of. You know it isn't going to end well, but you just can't stop watching. You have to see what happens. When re-watching Gabon, here is what is key to understand. The season is a mess. Jeff Probst gets annoyed and there isn't good gameplay. Watching the season for the drama and humor is the way to go, not for the gameplay. You have made my life hell from day one. To get you, go home, Goodbye. Number nine, season 19, Survivor Samoa. Here's yet another season that has an unsatisfying winner, bad gameplay from most players, and general pettiness. I am only listing it here because I rarely see the season listed as a favorite, despite how much it's talked about. Probably due to a multitude of factors though, namely a crazy uneven edit. But what makes this one so much different is that it is almost solely the fault of one man. Russell Hance plays this season thinking he has it in the bag. He will just talk mad trash behind everyone's back while playing an impressive game on paper. What he pulls off is quite impressive. So what do I mean when I say bad gameplay? I still mean Russell Hans. Let's think about this for a second. Survivor is really only about two things. Number one, get your butt into the final tribal council. And number two, convince your season specific jury to vote for you. And that's it. 
Nothing else is required of you to win the game. Russell Hance, though, only seems to understand step one, and that is what makes a rewatch so fascinating, watching one player dominate that one category so hard, but doing it to the detriment of actually winning the game makes for a case study on how to balance gameplay and social. The winner of the season seems to be 95% social and 5% gameplay, whereas Russell is 95% gameplay and 5% social. There is a balance between those two in the best winners but Samoa presents this classic conundrum which one is better? For a brief moment, I want to compare Survivor to American football. Craziness, I know, but hang with me, there is a point. In American football, there is a classic case of high-powered offense versus high-powered defenses. Football fans in general love high-powered offenses. They put on shows, rack up points, generally make for a good game because they tend to also have a lackluster defense, so it's just a high-scoring affair. Whereas defensive powerhouse teams stop whoever they are playing from scoring and usually make games low-scoring in general, though sometimes they can rack up points, but it's to the detriment of the game being watchable. So when the two of them face off, it becomes a classic debate of unstoppable train versus an unmovable brick wall. Which one will get its way? If you haven't already guessed which one it is, nine times out of 10, it's the unmovable wall. It's boring to watch, but effective. And the game I've been showing here is the Super Bowl from just a few years back when the number one offense, the Denver Broncos, gets absolutely crushed by the Seahawks' number one defense. Undoubtedly, good gameplay makes for fun TV, especially when it's flashy, which is why by the end of the first watch of the season, most regular viewers just expect a Russell win hands down. He is all over the TV making flashy moves, racking up a lot of points with the jury, at least in his mind. But Natalie White is hanging back, playing that defensive game. She is building social bonds with the jury and it's not fun to watch so you don't see a lot of it but she's making friends and just being a good person and generally just being boring for television even though in real life you would pick her over Russell any day to be friends with. If you were to put your life in either of these people's hands, you'd probably pick Natalie. This similar scenario played out again in season 39 when Tommy played a very boring game of Survivor, but beat Dean who tried playing flashy. But because Tommy was a better social player, he won. People felt like they got to know Tommy and were friends with him in the game. And some of the jury felt like they never got to know Dean at all. And that's why he didn't really have a chance despite all of his flashy moves. So what is the point I'm trying to make here? Why why is the season underrated? Why should I rewatch it? Great questions. It is underrated and needs to be rewatched as a case study of what not to do on Survivor. It sounds crazy because Russell does some things that are good, like finding idols without clues. And don't get me wrong, he'll remind you 20 times that he did that. In fact, that's what Russell's really good at. He's good at telling you everything he's doing right. He's really good at making a show of it. But Samoa makes an excellent case study to watch and see everything he did wrong. Now, he won't point out everything he did wrong. You have to look, ignore his confessionals, and laser focus in on who he is nice to, who you actually see him him talking with and when he begins to have an ego so large it causes him to start trashing the jury as they leave the game whereas Gabon makes for a fun beautiful mess that is best with popcorn Samo is probably best as a case study on the very fundamentals of Survivor so pull out a notebook and pen people will call you weak people will say that you are undeserving but you know what why are those characteristics any less admirable as lying cheating and stealing why does he get a free pass but your wrong way of playing is admonished. You would say that you were probably the least deserving of the title of Soul Survivor. But maybe, just maybe, in an environment filled with arrogance, maybe the person who thinks that she's least deserving is probably the most. Number eight, season 25, Survivor Philippines. The last two seasons I've talked about have had some extremes in them. Extreme characters, extreme gameplay, extreme chaos in a lot of ways. You know what Philippines has? an incredible collection of stories. The first collection of stories is the most obvious as this is a season featuring three returnees who are not really playing good games and never really have played good games, but instead were medically evacuated. So they're getting a second shot answering that long asked question. What if they weren't medically evacuated? Each have interesting backstories from their original seasons. And unlike other times when we see returnees play on a season with newbies, they don't strategically dominate them here. In fact, they're probably just in line with the rest of them when it comes to how good they are at playing the game. Sure, they might have a slight edge. I mean, they have been on Survivor before, but by no means is this Boston Robin Redemption Island. So getting the follow-up and conclusion to their what-if stories, meaning what if they weren't medically evacuated last time, reveals a lot about each of them and even spawns a scene that completely reshapes how I viewed Survivor as a show. Survivor is a big story. What's the story that's gonna to be told this season? 
Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? Who are the underdogs? Who is the audience going to be rooting for, consciously or not? What does the audience want to have happen? The audience is going to watch you. And they're going to say, she's being loyal to the people that she's been loyal to all along. And that's a wonderful thing. But they are not going to be happy that you are helping these three guys go further. And I'm not going to try to influence you to come over to my side. But I hope that you and Scoopin do the right thing and tell a better story. Penner is saying this to one of the newbies on the cast who is trying to make this monumental decision and has an incredible backstory before coming on the show, but her complete rawness while playing and her growth throughout the season is really the quintessential growth story on Survivor, the journey story, the becoming a better person, really learning who you are. In previous seasons, you would hear how this experience has changed the player and you might even see some small things that reflect that, but with Lisa, you see it in major ways throughout the entire season and it makes Philip one of the more narratively interesting seasons because of that. Oh, and how have I forgotten the Matt Singh tribe? I mean, we all know Zayn is the best player on the whole season, and it's a shame he was voted out first. However, it was one of the three worst tribes in Survivor history, in my opinion, and it sets the template for an interesting strategy that would be hard to pull off, but it has been proven successful enough times to consider it something to put in the tool belt if a player has to find themselves on a complete Titanic of a tribe. If a player happens to find themselves on a complete Titanic of a tribe, there's a Peridium video called the intentional Matt Singh, I recommend watching that. All in all, Philippines isn't just a good season, it's a great one, marking with it a lot of firsts and a surprisingly satisfying winner, which will be a rarity on this list. Oh, and it teaches a valuable life lesson about taxes. You know what pisses me off? Is I think I've made about $60 million playing baseball, and I want this freaking million dollars in this game. And it's not even a million bucks, it's 600 grand by the time Obama takes it. Number seven, season 35, Survivor Heroes, versus healers versus hustlers. The moaning and groaning this season has caused among the fan base has reached its breaking point. Yes, the final four fire making twist was a surprise. Yes, it did help a player who was probably going home at final four. And no, this is not the first time Survivor has done a surprise twist that has screwed someone in their game. These surprises date all the way back to season three. That doesn't make them right. That just means they're a part of the game. This is not something new. However, it is a hard pill to swallow if you're watching the season for the first time and you're not rooting for the eventual winner. If you're rooting for anyone else, uh, the twist isn't great for you. Unfortunately, this twist in the finale has soured the fanbase as a whole against a season that does feature great gameplay and a lighthearted mood throughout a lot of it. In a way, it's kind of the Game of Thrones of Survivor seasons. For many, it was oh so good until the very end, which made it feel like the whole season was pointless. I beg to differ, and this is why I think Heroes vs. Healers vs. Sussilers deserves to be rated higher than its bottom tier ranking that many give it. It doesn't suffer from any stretches of boredom like Ghost Island, or have players not really doing their best to win while also lacking in entertainment like in One World. The castaways are all here to play and it is unfortunate the final four twist was a surprise since it overshadows so many good elements in the season. The winner has an amazing underdog story that is hard to not root for because as any storyteller will tell you who is worth their salt, a character who is constantly working to approve themselves, whether if what they're doing is actually successful or not, will ultimately win over an audience or at the very least have the audience find them endearing. So give this season another chance, it is a good one with a winner who plays a flashy game but doesn't blow up his own game at the same time like in a past season that we have talked about. Because I'm not going home tonight. Secret, secret, secret. Number six, season four, Survivor Marquesas. We are going way back for this one. Marquesas is a season that has a lot of great things happen in it, but due to some poor storytelling choices, and as a result, didn't connect with the fan base the way it should have when watching it for the first time. To be fair, it does get slow at times. I will not deny that, and it is a bit weird to watch challenges where Jeff Probst does not narrating them, but what it lacks in those areas, it makes up for with incredible characters and some game-changing events. Marquesas marks the birth of Boston Rob. What I find among most fans is that their favorite iteration of him is actually when he was on The Amazing Race because he was having fun and it really felt like it was Boston Rob unchained. Amber wasn't keeping him cool and mayhem was always afoot. The only time he's truly like that but in Survivor is on Marquesas when there's no Amber in his life and Rob is just a nobody who hates the predictableness of how the game is going to play out. So by hook or by crook, he's gonna change the game. It is wildly 
entertaining and I will give him credit. He is a large part of what happens when not only is a strong player voted out pre-merge, unheard of by the way in these early seasons, but the Kingpin who is on the fast track to win it all is voted out because Boston Rob opened everyone's eyes to what they needed to do to win. Once that Kingpin is knocked down, the next three votes though are very predictable and that's the worst part of the season. That's just when the season suffers the most. But when it reaches the final five, the drama gets high again. The purple rock draw is revealed. The winner wins as a lone wolf instead of carrying the majority. They pretty much had no alliance from the time the merge hits. It's just them and one other person and that other person goes home at final five. It's crazy. Vesepia, the winner, is someone to pay close attention to. When re-watching, notice how the show will go out of its way to hide her or paint her as a villain when possible despite the fact that she is playing an incredible social game. It's a fascinating season on a rewatch. It's so, so good. I even feel a little fear when thinking about it. It's all on how smart these people are. If they realize if they need you, that's what will keep them loyal. Fear, basically, it's a tough principle. But fear keeps people loyal. If they're afraid they have something to lose, then they'll do what they tell you to do. That's straight out of the Godfather. It's true. Number five. Season 26, Survivor Karamoan. Oh boy. This season reminds me a lot of Gabon, but I think a lot of things work against it from the very beginning. That has it not being just nearly as fun as Gabon since we do know a lot of these people who are playing on this season from past seasons. Karamoan is very messy. Players constantly make bad decisions. Drama is at an all time high. Good gameplay exists for maybe a handful of players at best. And it is a season I secretly enjoy because of all of this. What hurts the season though is that it has the moniker of fans versus favorites. These are not fans. And those, for the most part, really are not favorites. Except for Malcolm and Eric Reichenbach, they are the only true favorite characters here. Let's be real, this season should be called Recruits versus Hot Messes. Now similar to Gabon and Samoa, let's reset our expectations with this season. It is a different beast after all. Now it has all the trappings of this era of Survivor. Mixing returnees with newbies, hidden immunity idol plays, and of course, under edits on characters you want to see more of. What makes Karamoan better on a rewatch is when you see how this is really just a tale of two seasons, a bit like Palau, a season that is beloved by all. In Palau, the first two thirds are really all about the tragedy of Oolong, whereas the last third is the story of Karor and their complex storylines. In Karamoan, it's kind of similar. The pre-merge has predictable gameplay with high drama, but once the post-merge hits, the gameplay is cranked up and the human drama is actually lessened. I will say, it's a nice change of pace halfway through the season. However, the storytelling is a bit loony and characters will just like burst onto the scene out of left field and you'd be like, what, where'd you come from? And then all of a sudden fade into the back when they're not needed anymore. In my opinion, the way to truly enjoy Karamoan for what it is, is just accept that you're watching a messy season with uh, no favorites. It's just recruits versus hot messes. After all, this is the season where Jeff Probst uh, kind of has a fling with Cochran instead of Boston Rob, which I'm sure made Boston Rob jealous. As I said before, recruits versus hot messes. Cochran. The survivor nerd has transformed into an all-around threat. Will he continue to dominate challenges and the game? Number four, season 30, Survivor Worlds Apart. Now this season is messy. No saying trends here. Messy seasons are not good seasons to show to someone new watching the show, but man, they are great guilty pleasures for those of us just looking for a fun rewatch of a season. And Worlds Apart is a fun rewatch. Unlike the past messy seasons on this list, the winner has a coherent story from beginning to end that is almost like a movie, which I I know is a common thing said by many. I'm not the first one to say that, but it's true. It's easy to root for him when he's up against a sea of villains in the post merge. Now the ugliness of the bullying is lessened when rewatching because you do know it's coming, but you do know the bullies won't win at the end. Similar to Gabon, there is a lot of pettiness and bickering over the dumbest of things like why Rodney has to wash dishes on his birthday and Mike going to get his letter, deciding against it and then being guilted into getting anyways, which completely shifts the season. However, I do can see this cast is very unique. If you don't like them after two or three episodes, they don't get any better. They are not a fine wine. Unlike other seasons on this list so far, this one rides or dies on whether you like the winner or not. And since I love him, anything negative about this season cannot break the Teflon of Mike Holloway. Similar to Karamoan, Worlds Apart has some uncomfortable moments, but at least here, the winner is an active participant in fighting back against it. Worlds Apart also brings with it an immunity streak that has not been seen so strongly since Ozzy and Cook 
Cook Islands, and it brings the death of the Survivor Auction, which is not a positive, but it is something unique about this season in particular. I sure hope they bring back the auction, but if this is the end for some reason, at least it went out on a memorable note. But please, please never ask Rodney to do dishes on his birthday. I, I don't want to hear it. Washing dishes on my birthday. Nine miserable days left on this island that doesn't even grow coconuts or any fruits. 0 for 5 on reward challenges. And a bunch of scumbags who neglected me on my birthday, who claim to be survivor family. Now, now all bets are off now. A bunch of scumbags. Not one reward. Unreal. Caroline and Sierra, they ain't going to the end. The only people who are going to the end under my watch is me. That's it. Number three, season 22, Survivor Redemption Island. Unlike all of the other seasons on this list, this one has only one redeeming factor for the entirety of its season, and that is Boston Rob. That's right, Jeff Probst's man crush. I've seen many people claim this season is a comedy, and I'm not sure if they mean that in a normal sense or an ironic sense. But I do admit this season is a lot of fun until Russell Hance is voted out, and then it just becomes the Boston Rob show through and through. There is a large focus on Philip, and he is a lot better when viewed as this man who is a major pawn in Boston Rob's game and not as an individual player on his own. He's really just the distraction Rob needs to keep the focus off of him for most of the season. There are a few fans who legitimately like this season, but they try to keep quiet since uh, most people hate it. I think I fall somewhere in the middle. Like Caramo, and I think Redemption Island is best when recontextualized. I don't think it's good on a first watch though. So let's do that though. Let's recontextualize this season so when you actually rewatch it, it can be thoroughly enjoyed. It is not a regular season of Survivor. There are very few characters who actually matter here, and once Hans is gone, you can literally skip every Zapatera scene and miss nothing of the storyline. This is a one-man narrative, like Samoa, except this time it is on how to win Survivor in the most perfect way possible. Despite Kim Spradlin doing a similar thing in One World, she just isn't as naturally entertaining as Boston Rob. He just relishes in entertaining us every step of the way, telling us exactly what he thinks, shaping a story around what he is doing. And as you should know, Survivor loves stories, and so do I. He takes the narrative, and he wants you to believe certain things that he says in his confessionals and purposely drags the biggest messes he can to the end of this game. Characters who cause drama, characters who will mindlessly do what he says strategically, and paints anyone who opposes him in the slightest as the spawn of Satan. It is the closest we will ever get to a POV season of Survivor, and its drastically different tone, because of that, is off-putting to many who want better gameplay and a more balanced edit. But what is there to really balance Boston Rob, unlike Russell, is actually calling all the shots here and is controlling the game. It really doesn't even matter what it says because I already have the idol. So, I will just throw it away in the volcano. Bye bye. Number two. Season 9, Survivor Vanuatu. If you have not seen this season recently, or if you've never even seen it, you have to watch it. There are some flaws I want to address because understanding them may help your enjoyment of the season as there are so many positives, but this first flaw does drag down the season and I understand why it's hard for some to get into. That first flaw, and for me this is the biggest one, is that the first four episodes are kind of meh. Nothing really special happens that draws you in, combined with a premiere that should have been 90 minutes that was cut down to to a regular episode's length at the last minute, along with an unnecessary double tribal council in episode 3, makes it hard as an audience to connect to many of these characters. These first four episodes are why most get turned off from the season, and I think that's a real shame as once the earthquake, and yes, a literal earthquake, does hit, in episode 5, the season really gets going from there. You see, that earthquake happens minutes before the tribe swap when the women begin their complete takeover of the game, which is all a wonderfully entertaining setup for the amazing final seven. Once the women eliminate every man until there is only one left, him being Chris, they start going after each other and Chris goes all out with his lying and schmoozing to completely wipe the floor and by the end of the game he is clearly the best player there no question about it. Despite his many flaws and failures leading up to the final seven, it actually makes his story all that more intriguing. And it almost feels like a movie in a lot of ways with an interesting cast of characters, but with the nearly fatal flaw of just a slow beginning. A good season of Survivor catches your interest from the beginning and Vanuatu, I admit, fails to do that. But by the time it all concludes, you'll be left with your jaw on the floor wondering how Chris is schmoozing his way into all these women's hearts while simultaneously putting on one of the best final tribal council performances of all time. To to me, Vanuatu is proof that you don't need hidden immunity idols to turn the tide when facing overwhelming odds. Without a doubt, the one thing that's changing me as a person is experience in playing the game with the final nine people 
and seeing the genuine qualities people possess when there's a million dollars at stake. But uh, in the latter stages of the game, I found that the money started talking. I started looking at getting to the end no matter what. They looked past the million dollars, and it, it's something I didn't do. It's something I'll take with me to try to become a better person. Honorable mention, season one, Survivor Borneo. I wanted to put Borneo on this list, but I just couldn't figure out a spot for it. I mean, how do you consider the season that kickstarted this whole show and made it a massive success, an underrated season? But it does seem like over the years, fans have found this season to be more and more unwatchable, which I do understand. It's hard to go from those fast paced modern seasons all the way back to this. It could give you some serious whiplash. Like a few seasons on this list, you have to adjust your expectations accordingly accordingly as Borneo is the only season that feels like we are truly watching a documentary. It really feels like 16 people really were just stranded on an island and told to fend for themselves with the occasional survivor challenge and tribal council taking place. Like Vanuatu, it does start slow, but by the end, the drama just keeps intensifying, especially once the merge hits. It's like a snowball, it just keeps rolling. You truly get to see the genesis of basic survivor strategy and how strongly others react to it. This season, unlike all the others, feels like a raw social experiment because by the time season two airs, Everyone on that season had already seen season one and knows that this show that they're on is crazy successful. The people in Borneo had no idea. They're taking a risk. Everyone making the show is taking a risk. No one knows what's going to happen. And it's the realness of what is taking place that makes it a truly unique watch, especially when the merge vote happens and it is four to one to one to one to one to one. Jenna. Rich. Rudy. Sue. Colleen. Jervis. Oh my god. Gretchen. 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 Oh my god. That's Travis spoken. And maybe I'm being paranoid and I didn't want to believe it, but four people from Tagi voted for Gretchen, I think. Some people have started taking it a different way because there's really no good reason other than strategy to vote Gretchen off. Number one, season 38, Survivor Edge of Extinction. Oh man, this season has garnered some strong reactions. Some of the strongest I think I've ever seen, which I think makes it a success. Nothing is worse for me than feeling nothing when a season of Survivor is done and just going, meh, that was okay. Season 38 does not suffer from that whatsoever. Once again, let's recontextualize because I agree that the two players coming back in the game should have come back at the merge and not any later. Later, and I also agree that they should not have been given any immunity idols. I can't change that though, that's just what happened. Let's remember a very, very, very similar twist happened in Pearl Islands where the two returnees also had immunity and that season is now beloved. Edge of Extinction is an interesting beast because only one episode this season had almost zero effect on the story, that being episode five. Once Rick is voted out in episode four, you really could skip to episode six and miss nothing. But seeing the downfall of Rick and Chris through the first four episodes along with the the domination by Kama sets up an incredible post-merge game along with what has to be my favorite finale of all time. Though I have not ranked the finales, that's just my opinion off the top of my head. Think of Rick and Chris coming back into the game as a rebirth, a second chance if you will, because when they both come back, they have experienced death in Survivor and they hate it. So they both play their butts off to stay alive. The entire post-merge creates a Goliath out of an underdog because no doubt about it, Rick is an underdog all game. Even when Chris comes back into the game, but it is clear that he is a Goliath with the jury, which is the one thing to be a Goliath with. If he gets to the end, he's winning, no doubt about it. It is so painfully obvious and the show doesn't even try to hide this at all. So when Chris comes in at final six and proceeds to be a sheep in wolf's clothing to help Rick survive just long enough so that the final four, he can rip off his sheep costume and sling a stone at Rick's head, effectively killing him for good this time. It feels like we just experienced an M. Night Shyamalan twist. Like we could have seen it coming the whole time, but how would we have known it was told so well? All the signs were there all game. We just didn't see them. It is not classic Survivor. And as a one-off season, I'm okay with that. I would never want Survivor to make this become a regular thing. In fact, I don't want that. But for this one time, the narrative it creates is something I've been intrigued with since the season ended. It also helps that the cast surrounding these two are memorable. And had they all been on a regular season, a la David versus Goliath, this would probably be a top tier season, no doubt. So tonight, I am offering up my immunity necklace. Oh my. This is yours, Julie. And I will be making fire against Rick Devins tonight. <laughs> wow. 
So let's look at what you all think. I asked you all on Patreon and on YouTube for your opinions. I tallied them up and here are your top 11 underrated seasons. Number 11, season 30, Worlds Apart. Number 10, season nine, Survivor Vanuatu. Number nine, season 39, Survivor Island of the Idols. Number eight, season 26, Survivor Caramoan. Number seven, season 12, Survivor Exile Island. Number six, season 19, Survivor Samoa. Number five, Season 4, Survivor Marquesas. Number 4, Season 14, Survivor Fiji. Number 3, Season 38, Survivor Edge of Extinction. Number 2, Season 11, Survivor Guatemala. And number 1, Season 17, Survivor Gabon. So what do you think about these underrated seasons? Will you be re-watching any of them? Is there one that you think is underrated but just wasn't mentioned here? Let me know down in the comments below. Thanks for tuning in and I want to give an even bigger thanks to the patrons as they made this video happen and it was made at their request. Once again, thanks for watching.